About a year ago, I was digging through some trash cans at school when I came across this amazing book from 1933. It's called The Chemical Formulary, and it's filled with all these different recipes from things like plastics to adhesives to explosives and pharmaceuticals. It's an amazing book. It has all these really brilliant ideas, but there are also a few just completely crazy ones, and those are the ones I'm going to try today. Now, I feel like I'm stating the obvious here, but please don't try any of these things at home. Like, some of these uh, recipes in here could either blow your hands off, give you cancer, or even kill you in one breathful for the ones that make cyanide gas. So yeah, just leave that to me, please. And without further ado, let's get started. Don't you hate it when your coins are all dirty? Well, using this book, you can actually clean them yourself. All you need is a gallon of water and enough cyanide to kill 2,000 people. Now, unfortunately, I only have a few grams of cyanide, so I can only make enough to clean, you know, a few handfuls of coins, as opposed to, like, a truckload. Why do I even own cyanide? Man, why do I even do this crap? There's enough cyanide inside this little vial to kill me, like, 50 times over. So just the fact that I'm handling this stuff should definitely earn your subscription. I'll paint it on there. Oh, look at that. The tarnish is coming right off. The cyanide's probably reacting with the, uh, copper and the copper oxide and uh, reducing it to make a copper cyanide complex. Hmm, what smells like almonds? Man, I don't like touching that. Wow, look how shiny that penny became. Now that's a coin worth risking your life over. This recipe claims that it can make fabric fireproof. Now fireproof? We'll see about that. I mixed up a batch of this fireproofing stuff using some roach killer and lye, and although it sounds pretty scary, it's identical to what's used in the book. The cloth on the left is the one that was dipped in that fireproofing solution. Ah, impressive, look at that. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, I'm going to give that one a C, because it definitely was harder to light, but once it lit, it wasn't stopping. Now, I won't be demonstrating this one for you today, but I just can't help but wonder the circumstances for when this recipe actually got used. Alright, this one's pretty interesting. Solidified alcohol. And the chemistry just looks like making soap and alcohol solution. Now, why you need solidified alcohol, I'm not sure, but it sounds like fun. Now, heating flammable liquids to nearly their boiling point is never really a great idea, but I did it and survived and made some of this cool solid alcohol. So does it ignite? Let's find out. Ah, oh, cool. I feel like this would make a great camping fuel. Now, I know what you're thinking. Does it still burn when it's flying through the air? Well, one way to find out, I guess. Yep, definitely still burns. Man, this stuff is so much fun. I wish I would have known about this as a kid. Actually, no, that would have probably been a terrible idea. Have a family member or pet die recently? Well, funerals can be expensive. But lucky for you, there is a nice recipe in here for some corpse tissue filler. Here's one from the photography section called flashlight powder. Now, when I think of a flashlight, I think of, you know, a continuous beam of light. But judging from the chemicals used in this, this definitely looks like something that will flash blind you for like 15 minutes. It's been a while since I've had a good flash blinding, so I stuck some of that flashlight powder on top of that tomato here. Whoa! That was so bright. I'm going to be seeing spots for hours. Okay, this one's one of my favorites. It's an asthma remedy that involves mixing a bunch of herbs, some of them toxic, and mixing it with the main ingredient in gunpowder, and then putting it into a pipe and smoking it. How is that supposed to make your lungs feel better? Here's one that sounds about as dangerous as it is fun. So it's a reusable match. So it's supposedly a match that you can strike on a surface and light, blow it out, and then relight it again sometime in the future. Like, that sounds amazing, but I'll have to see it to believe it. The pyroxylin that this recipe called for is pretty much impossible to turn into a powder, so I had to dissolve it in acetone before mixing it with the other chemicals. But then I was able to, to mold it into some match heads and stick it on the end of pencils. Alright, let's see if this thing works. Rubbing the match heads on concrete didn't light them, so I had to put them on a grinding wheel. Oh, that didn't go out. So 
So just like I thought, this one was too good to be true. In the end, they just turned out to be really crappy matches. Here's a cold remedy that involves inhaling a mixture of chloroform, formaldehyde, ether, and alcohol, and plus a few herbs. Like, that's ridiculous! Like, the chloroform and formaldehyde are definite carcinogens, and then the chloroform and ether, that's like a Civil War era anesthetic. This will literally render you unconscious. So I decided to put a little bit of uh, chloroform, ether, and isopropyl alcohol in this bottle, just to give this a, uh, a test. So let's see. <coughs> oh my gosh! Ugh! Smells like cancer. All right, here's one I know won't work well. So it's a recipe for black powder, and it's a mixture of potassium nitrate, sulfur, and charcoal. And now the ingredients aren't the issue, but they make it seem like you can make good gunpowder by just mixing these ingredients together. It doesn't work that way. Making good black powder is really an art form. You can't just simply mix the components together. It needs to be milled together with something like a ball mill, and then granulated with a solvent. And to top it off, the speed of the black powder is highly dependent on the kind of charcoal that you use. On the left is 50 grams of black powder made by the book, and then on the right is 30 grams of my own homemade stuff. Now I'm going to put them both through the golf ball cannon to see how they act. Man, I have a lot of redneck artillery. First I loaded the cannon with the stuff based on the book's recipe. And it's not that impressive. Then I loaded it with some of the powder that I made based on polonia charcoal. And as you can tell, it's much, much better than the book's recipe. Poison ivy sucks. But according to this book, relief from itching is just a few lethal doses of lead away. Here's one called an Oriental Barometer, and I guess it's supposed to change colors depending on whether it's humid or not. Sounds interesting. I painted some cobalt chloride solution on this fake flower, and although the effect is subtle, it definitely changes color in high humidity. Now I know I've been fairly hard on this book, but in reality this book would have been very useful to somebody who knew a little bit of chemistry in the 30s, because it's not like they had the internet to go look things up. There are a ton of good recipes in here for lots of different things that you could encounter in your daily life. So it really was a, a good book for the time. Well, other than the pharmaceutical section at least. And the pesticide section. Definitely not the pesticide section. So that's about it for this video. But until the next time, stay safe and happy fumigating.